You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of space. Cyberspace. A space composed only of unfathomable reaches of endless publicity, full of games so goddamn strange that I don't want anything to do with them. Hundreds of them will die here forgotten, except for four games that you may never have heard of otherwise. You have just entered my inbox. And going through my inbox is always a great reason to check out another good shmup. Mushihimi-sama has come to Steam as a new English language port of a cave shooter that came out on the PS2 10 years ago. And I didn't know about this game at all until after getting press releases for the Steam version, brought to us by the good folks at Dejika. This Steam release is one of two English versions to ever come out, the other being on iOS, and I doubt you want to play a shooter with this much bullet density on a cell phone. After last year's English release of Crimson Clover and the success of Jamestown before it, and more mainstream takes on the concept, like A City Sleeps, it seems like bullet hells are finally starting to get a good foothold on Western audiences, and Mushihimi-sama makes for another great feather in that cap. Plus, it marks a distinct turning point where, uh, shmup started to get stylistically weird for a while. Mushihimi-sama has you playing as a well-endowed Japanese girl who's just as horrifyingly destructive as she sounds sleepy. If you're easily distracted, you certainly can change the background wallpaper to number four. And if you're intimidated by just how many bullets are on the screen, don't be. The trick to these games is just hold down the fire button and focus on dodging. Plus, your alt fire button throttles speed, so when you need to make more precise moves, you actually are required to use less precision in your inputs. Also, this version seems to include some kind of emulated slowdown effect for when things get really crazy. Fraps is reporting 60 frames per second, but that sure as hell is not 60 frames per second, and it's actually serving as a valuable assist. Before you know it, you'll be witnessing yourself perform reflex-intensive feats that you didn't even know you were capable of. And there's nothing as rewarding or satisfying as that feeling. And just like all the other great bullet hells, a one-credit run in this one is the only way to get to the final boss to fairly consider yourself beating this game. On your way there, you'll blast past excellent pixel art and dastardly spread patterns, dazzling visual feedback, and about as much spectacle and bombast as the best of this genre can offer. Between Crimson Clover, Jamestown, and now Mushihimi-sama, and the shmup sales that GOG has been trying to put out, the past couple years have been a great time to start getting into bullet hells. Planet Diver is an endless runner port over from mobile phones that is actually pretty darn neat. Mostly because of how gleefully high concept it all is. You're this crazy space girl who just wants to dive into planets, and that's that's actually all it is. You dive down a tunnel, dodge obstacles, increase and decrease speeds as you counterbalance risk and rewards to collect star stuff, because that's actually all it is. That's, that's really what the stuff that looks like stars is called. This game doesn't have a care in the world. It has a cheerful, upbeat style to it that I love. Bad jokes are everywhere, catchy music and adorable artwork are everywhere. It's a fast-paced, quick reflex test of control and planning that has you stopping and starting in and out of incredible scrolling speeds to string together hit combos for massive payouts to a crisp, shaking screen, and every hit, it feels so good! But although there is an amateur lack of polish to its take on pixel art, thankfully you can turn the CRT filter off, but probably the bigger concern is that this is a port of a game designed to be played on cell phones. It's meant for shorter sessions than what you're probably going to give it on PC. The same fun little challenge repeated over and over again this quickly, no matter how fun it is, is bound to get old fast. But there's still a lot of content to go through. Once you've hit up enough of those story missions, with fun banter preceding each one before tackling a wide and interesting variety of objectives, you find the Upgrades Shop, and what an Upgrades Shop it is. Just when I was about to complain about the lack of diversity in backgrounds and music tracks, I found this long, long list of alternate soundtracks, planet levels, and gameplay mods that change everything. You can even dress your girl up in Nintendo costumes. They have Samus, they have Chell from Portal, they even have Luca from Chrono Trigger. H how the hell are they getting away with that? It's great. In conclusion, this game's cool as hell, no one knows about it, and that's why I make these videos. Here we have a cutesy little side-scroller with higher tech pixel art than usual that has these intricate circuitry-themed texture patterns on everything and non-combat puzzle mechanics that rely on using the trigger buttons to play with perspective. Sound familiar? 
Poncho takes obvious inspiration from Fez, except in this one you have to think two-dimensionally and phase in and out of backgrounds and foregrounds, because making three-dimensional pixel art and designing levels for that would be insanely complicated. But like Fez, it's the same kind of meditative experience driven by scenic exploration, crafty puzzles, and a bit of player-driven Metroidvania backtracking for a whole lot of collectibles. Although I suppose time will tell if there's also some kind of crazy, reality-warping ARG metagame to it once you're all over with the first run. But until then, I know this isn't going to be everybody's jam. And one reason is because even visualizing the puzzle mechanic in this game is a convoluted process. You can't really tell which background or foreground layer any piece of platform is on unless it's in motion. Unless you can visibly track the speeds that the different layers are scrolling past you with. Plus, there are a lot of clutter items for decoration that seem like they should be walkable platforms but aren't. A lot of elements here had me missing a lot of jumps and just calling bullshit on them. Regardless though, it is an honest effort. Beautiful to look at, and cute, tingly, and warm when it needs to be. <laughs> and what other type of video would I ever get the chance to talk about a virtual reality edutainment tech demo about cell biology? Incel is meant to be played with a VR headset, but it works on controllers and keyboards anyway. You shrink down to microscopic size to fight an influenza infection by, uh, racing on the tubular fire field track from F-Zero GX. It's beautiful. There's a real sense of speed and distance and also presence inside your little microscopic cockpit as you speed past a massive and gorgeous representation of what may be happening inside your colon right now. There's even a little bit of FTL mechanics thrown in for funsies as you strategically choose your next level based on a hard time limit of enemy forces catching up behind you between the levels. And that's really cool. Almost everything about this whole concept, except the annoying robot voice, makes for a really cool little $5 proof of concept demo about the edutainment potential of virtual reality. It sure is still a cheesy video game, but it's also one step closer to the sci-fi dream of living digital tourism for real places that only your imagination can travel to. Once the consumer versions of good VR gaming headsets finally come out, I'll definitely be checking out quite a few games like this one.